the opportunity to present my research here. Um, so I'm quite excited to talk to you today about the time variability of star formation. So all the work that I'll present has been on close collaboration with Nevin Chopler, John Forbes, who is also here, and Kartik Iyer. And so we have heard throughout the week that um, star formation histories are shaped by a wide range of difficult, diff different physical processes, including re-accretion of outflows, AGN feedback, mergers, cosmological accretion, even cloud physics, and so on. So there's this wide range of physical processes, and of course they you know, have influence on the star formation histories on different timescales. So some vary on small timescales, some on larger timescales, but there's also this spatial correlation acting on small versus on long timescales. And what I want to understand is, of course, if you have a good handle on the star formation history, you, of course, can learn something about, you know, these star formation and <coughs> feedback processes that place, take place in, in galaxies. But from a galaxy evolution perspective, of course, there are also other interesting questions that we can, you know, take away from star formation histories. As we have heard this morning by, by Sandy Faber, you know, a major challenge for us in observations is still to understand how we can link galaxies through cosmic time, because each new galaxy is just observed once during its whole lifetime, and we observe these scaling relations between, for example, star formation rate and stellar mass at different epochs, but we don't really understand how individual galaxies evolve about these relations with cosmic time. Um, related to this, of course, we have you know, other questions also related to star formation histories, for example, about dwarf galaxies, cusp core transformation, metallicity enrichment, and so on. And so with Avishai Dekel and, and his research group, I was looking at some point into the VILA simulations, and what we looked into is basically distance from the star forming main sequence, and try to understand how galaxies are confined to this rather narrow you know, relation between star formation rate and stellar mass. And what we found is that galaxies are moving up and down the star forming main sequence, and a crucial part of the ingredient to understand how this takes place was actually the space resolved scales. So what we found is that these galaxies at early times are rather gas rich and compaction events can basically lead to a high gas central density then leads then to a higher star formation rate overall but also on space resolved scales in the central part. Now because the gas gets consumed into stars and the stars themselves blow up, you know, also drive outflows, the galaxy actually depletes from the gas and wants you know, to basically fall below the star forming main sequence. But because at these early times, re-accretion happens on short time scales, shorter than the depletion time, we basically you know, are able to keep the galaxies on this rather narrow main sequence. And the galaxies can go through such phases several times. And there have been a lot of observational work looking at gradients because this model makes quite strong predictions on how the specific gradient you know, varies as a function not only as mass, but also distance from the star forming main sequence. And so today I want to focus not about this, but I want to focus more about you know, these wiggles about the star forming main sequence. So how do these galaxies evolve about the main sequence? Basically, the question is, you know, how do these, you know, is the scatter of the main sequence built up? Is it based on fluctuations on short time scales, so that are bursty star formations, or more on longer time scales, you know, basically much smoother star formation histories? And there have been several works looking into this, including, including Aldo's work that basically linked, um, you know, the star formation process to the dark matter accretion and finding that long time oscillations from dark matter, basically from the dark matter accretion, can relate to the scatter of the main sequence quite nicely. But even you know, going a step back, I was wondering you know, how can I quantify these different um, you know, evolutionary patterns basically. And there you know, from the HN light curve community, it's, it's quite you know, usual to basically look at the structure function or at the power spectral density to understand you know, how much strength of the fluctuations do you have on different time scales. And so this is basically the idea I don't want to follow um, through this talk. Um, so, but let's take maybe a step back and start thinking first about the regulator model or also sometimes called the bathtub model. And, you know, key developers, of course, are sitting here in the room. Um, I just want to quickly mention what the key ingredients are. Basically, you have some gas accretion onto the galaxy. The galaxy is just this, you know, simple, uh, you know, machinery where you have some gas mass that gets turned into stellar mass via the star formation rate, you know, via the depletion time. And then you have some outflows, um, and the outflow rate is related to the star formation rate via the mass loading. And so if you look at this simple picture, you can write down the equation for mass conservation of the gas mass, and you can reformulate this basically via the equilibrium time, which is nothing else in depletion time, you know, roughly divided by the outflow, uh, the mass loading. You can write the star formation rate of the system in this way. And you see the crucial ingredient here is really the inflow rate, or here the renormalized inflow rate, you know, via the equilibrium time scale. And a lot of models, a, mo a lot of um, those people have assumed basically this is related to the dark matter accretion. And these models are working actually very well. 
Um, what I want to understand now um, is basically what happens if I stochastically feed the galaxy. So thinking of the regulator model and you're throwing, you know, randomly gas onto it. This can be motivated, you know, by different things. First of all, you know, the accretion maybe from dark matter itself is random, but also there is, you know, basically the reincorporation of outflows might, you know, make the picture quite complicated. And so if you assume that the accretion rate is basically a white noise process, um, then you can solve this um, equation. And what you found for the power spectrum is basically, you know, this, this equation is for a damp random walk. So the power spectrum, um, so how much power do you have on which oscillation time scale, is basically a simple, um, you know, broken power law. So you have um, some, you know, frequency dependence um, with the power of two on, on high frequencies or on short time scales. And then on longer time scales, you basically decorrelate and you have, you know, basically the white noise pattern again. Now, I know it's afternoon and everybody's kind of digesting their, their lunch maybe, so I just want to make one example here. So, you know, if we are taking now, for example, the regulator model, assume a depletion time that's rather short of 100 million years. Um, this is the inflow pattern, and you can see when the depletion time is short and therefore, you know, the equilibrium time scale is short, basically the bathtub or the regulator model is able to adjust very quickly to the inflow rate. And so you see that, you know, when there are spikes in, in blue in the inflow rate, the regulator model basically picks up these spikes quite naturally and then one of, you know, basically falls down to the equilibrium solution um, on this order of this time scale. What I'll show you on the right here is basically in the power spectrum of these star formation histories. So first of all, the PSD, um, the power spectrum for the inflow rate is basically just this white noise process. So you see it's a flat power spectrum. And then when we look into the regulator model, you have indeed this, you know, broken, broken power law. And again, you have this basically power law slope of two here down. This means that, you know, up to these time scales, your star formation history is correlated. It has a memory of what happened before. You have basically gas accretion and the star formation rate will, you know, will, will be basically higher because of this re recent accretion. And then what I mark here is basically two pi the equilibrium time scale. And so after that time scale, you basically decorrelate, you lose memory, and then you have basically, again, you recover again the, the PSD of the inflow rate. And you can do this with another example. So with a longer depletion time, in this case, the, the equilibrium time scale is longer, and therefore also the break time scale is longer. And you see the star formation history still reacts to these, you know, bursty inflows, but in, to much lesser degree, and the star formation rate is correlated over longer time scales. Now, when I talked with Andy about this a few, you know, weeks or months ago, he was saying, like, yeah, but star formation takes place in GMCs. So I was thinking of how to add this into the GMC model. And so there with, with John Forbes, we have been quite a lot thinking about how to incorporate this into, into this model. And what we are doing at the moment is basically saying, okay, we, we assume um, some mass function for the, the GMCs, for the molecular clouds. And we're basically randomly sampling this mass function in order to achieve the star formation rate that we want to get from the regulator model. And so we also have to assume some lifetime distribution of molecular clouds and some efficiency. And so basically with these assumptions um, that we can, for example, take from local observations, we can basically get the star formation rate for each GMC of a given mass and then drive the number of GMCs we randomly have to draw on average in order to achieve the star formation rate of the regulator. And so when we add this to the regulator model basically on top, what we do is basically this is the, you know, the star formation rate of the regulator model. These you know, shown in purple, the yellow one is basically adding this GMC sampling on top of that. And you see that we get this extra burstiness, you know, uh, for the star formation history. And so if I take, if we are taking now the power spectrum of this, basically what we found is that the power spectrum density now has this extra component coming in from um, the GMC. So again, we have the inflow PSD. This is the PSD we just expect from the regulator model. And now in, in orange, basically you see the regulator plus GMC. You see that you follow this orange uh, curve, and then up here it goes up to this. So again, on short time scales, the power sc spectrum is dominated by the GMC model. On these intermediate time scales, by the, by the regulator model, and on long time scales, basically, by the inflow. And, and so this is, you know, the nice thing that we can do this now is basically drive this analytically, and what we find is that the break in the power spectrum actually is related to the average lifetime of molecular clouds. And this is quite, in, it's independent of efficiency. It's basically just a weightening, the efficiency and, and, and so on. It's basically just a weightening. And if you take this into account, you can really see that the break in the power spectrum is related to the lifetimes. And, and so, you know, like on long time scales, it might be interesting to understand how we maybe can get um, lifetime constraints for microclouds from integrated properties. 
But so we have now a quite good analytical understanding. If we would have a power spectrum that is basically made up of two components, the upper limit is you know, basically given by the inflow. Then we have a component coming in from the regulator model and a second component that comes in from this GMC model. And, and so now, of course, it would be interesting to see more sophisticated models. And you know, I just you know, want to show you here quickly with Kartik Ayer. I had the pleasure to work um, during the Kavli Summer School last, last summer. Um, and, and when we're looking into the FIRE2 simulation, for example, we can see this kind of pattern where we see a slope of roughly two on short time scales, and then on longer time scale, the star formation history decorrelates, and then there's maybe you know, a second peak. What Kartik has done in his work is basically looking at different numerical models. So I'll show you here two models. Um, one is, to fire, uh, one is um, Eagle, the other one is Illustrious TNG. And you see these are average star formation histories for different massed galaxies at redshift zero. So these are the more massive galaxies at redshift zero, this is the lower mass galaxies at redshift zeros. And you see the star formation histories are very similar in the models. And this is you know, no surprise because they have been basically trying to reproduce the mass function and the star formation cell and mass relation um, at different epochs. The interesting part is now if you look at the power spectrum for these different models, you can basically see that the power spectrum of these simulations are quite different. And so you can see that you know, the shapes overall are different and also the overall power. And so he has been looking into this in, in different models. Um, and I think what I want to just highlight here, because I don't have too much time, is basically that it is maybe an interesting parameter space to look at. Even we have models that you know, basically give you the same star formation history on average. The power on different scales might tell us a lot about how you know, feedback is implemented and gives us an ability to compare these different models with each other. So I'll use the last um, three minutes, four minutes, um, for um, you know, trying to also now um, understand how we can use this framework to, to constrain this observationally. So this work has been published recently. Um, and so what we were assuming in, in, in that work is basically the, the power spectrum density can be modeled by this broken power law. So in comparison with before, we have now this alpha. It's not just set to two. It's actually a free parameter in our, in our model. And so again, we basically have on short time scales in high frequencies, um, some slope alpha. And then basically, you know, after tau break, the process decorrelates and is flat. And so we have basically these two free parameters in the model, tau break and alpha, and we want to constrain this observationally. So I'm going to show you some examples um, of how this looks. So when we basically change tau to longer time scales, we basically move power to longer time scales, and you see basically the star formation history gets smoother. Similarly, if we change alpha, if we increase alpha, then you basically have more power on short time scales. And so now if you have such a, such, such a star formation history, what we wanted to do is we, we, we show that we can basically um, use different star formation rate tracers. So this is the intrinsic star formation rate. If I now plot how the star formation rate varies in the different indicators, for example, in H alpha, it's maybe hard to see from behind, but the H alpha is basically able to trace intrinsic star formation rate quite well because it is a short time indicator. If you take something that you know, is, is depending on longer time scales, such as you know, UV or you go even to the U band, you see that the star formation rate overall you know, is, is much smoother. But in addition to this, you see that the valleys are basically uh, filled up when you have a long time indicator. And so you have two effects. One is that you have a smaller scatter when you have a long time indicator, and also an overall bias towards higher values. And so what we did then is basically we modeled uh, you know, the width of the main sequence. So this is you know, intrinsic width of 0.4 dex. Um, this is at you know, 1 million year, basically. And now we vary the intrinsic star formation histories for 1,000 galaxies going from being not so bursty to, to be bursty. And so now you can see, basically, if you take, um, for example, H alpha and UV in, in this star formation history, because in these star formation histories, they don't vary that much over the, you know, the time scale considered, we basically are able to recover the intrinsic main sequence with all indicators. When we are going to the bursty case, H alpha is still able to basically you know, get the whole burstiness, basically you know, really track the whole distribution. But if you think of an indicator that you know, sums up all of these fluctuations for all the galaxies, then you get a distribution that is basically offset and also much narrower. And so H alpha is basically still able to get something close to the intrinsic distribution, but in the other indicators we have this bias. And so basically from these ratios then, you can go and try to constrain this observationally. And so what was, there was this recent very nice work um, by the Gamma survey where they constrained the main sequence width um, for many different galaxies in the local universe, uh, different samples. And so what we choose is just you know, a narrow mass range around 10 to the 10.5. And we looked into the ratios basically of the different star, star formation um, 
width measurements of the main sequence. And what, we, what I show you here is basically the different you know, the distributions. So you know, U-band over H-alpha, for example, gives you this blue strip. And so the best, you know, basically our resulting lines are, are as basically in this parameter range. And you see we have this degeneracy between alpha and tau, but overall tau will be somewhere around, you know, 2 to 2.75 in log space. So we ex estimate tau break to be roughly 300 million years. And so this means basically that you can think of the star formation history of all these kind of galaxies actually decorrelates roughly of the order of the dynamical time scale. Just the last statement I would like to make is that, you know, this is a very rough estimate. So in this work, you know, the main focus was for to put forward this idea of the power spectra. This estimate is, I think, is very rough. We have to worry much more about um, other effects. Um, for example, we can think of high mass IMF variations, stellar population models, such as rotation and binaries, metallicities, dust situation. And all of these things are basically degenerative bursiness. So if you want to understand bursiness, I think we have to really think very hard of how to break these degener degeneracies also in the future. Okay, so here are my conclusions. Again, I tried to, you know, describe to you that power spectrum might be a nice way to describe bursiness. Um, it can be used in simulations quite naturally. In observations, I think it's, it's much more challenging. I showed you a simple, you know, regulator plus GMC model. The, there are two breaks in the power spectrum in this model where, you know, one corresponds to the average lifetime of GMCs, the other one to the equilibrium time scale of the regulator model. And as I said, I think different galaxy evolution model, you know, span actually a quite wide range in parameter space, and that's why I think it's quite interesting to think more about this also from an observational perspective. And using very rough observational estimates, what we found at redshift zero is a tau break of roughly 300 million years. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sandro. You were within one minute, so I'm going to give you one as well. Oh, but I heard it's Belgium chocolate, right? <laughs> I'm Swiss, so no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any questions for Sandro? <laughs> Arian. Yes. 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 No, I think there are, yes. Uh, yeah, so I think there are a lot of observational issues also how to measure, right? H alpha that is maybe coming from the central region to the aperture corrections. And, and so I, I, we, have, we have looked into this. I think there is um, observational uncertainties to drive these star formation rate. When we look at the recent gamma results, where they really just focus on measuring the, the width measurements with different indicators, and they discuss this at length of how to correct for certain biases and also how to select the galaxy samples. There they actually find exactly that, you know, what, what, we, what we basically put forward. Yeah. Uh, Sandy? Otherwise, sorry, otherwise the method wouldn't have worked, actually. Yeah. Has anybody started to look at single galaxies observed in different indicators to compare residuals for that galaxy measured different ways? So, I, I mean, I think... Um, Yi Cheng Guo has looked into this in, in partially. So I think, yes, we can look in the individual galaxies and how they change. The basic idea of our approach is basically to, to use an ensemble of galaxies because the problem is when you just have one ratio, you don't know exactly in which evolutionary phase you are. But if you take an ensemble of galaxies, you can basically say like, ah, oh, all of these galaxies you know, have the same power spectrum and then you can probe different, different parts of the time series to get also the longer time scales. And so just looking at individual galaxies, it will be hard to basically estimate any break, you know, at 300 million years if you have one, just one object. It should be tried. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, Neil? Yes, I, I think we will be able to tell that th these things apart. But as I said, it, 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 um, you know, at the end it comes back to comparing H alpha to UV to something else. And the problem at the moment is that we can think of, you know, 
ratio changes because of the Balmer lines to the, to, the, to the continuum, because of dust attenuation in front of young and older stars, uh, because of IMF variations, um, because of you know, binarity and so on. So there are many issues, but I think we can address those. I think you know, maybe using other indicators in, in the UV, for example, that are not depending on IMF. And so, so there are ideas, but I think it's, it's not as easy to follow them, them up, but for sure worth it, yeah. All right, thank you very much.